Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 23, Rotational Motion. In previous lectures, we were looking at circular motion, which is very similar in a way, but here we're talking about objects that are rotating about a central axis. So anytime we have a situation like this, we consider it to be rotational motion. So in this discussion, we are going to start defining a lot of new quantities. But all of these quantities parallel exactly what we talked about in the beginning of our course when we talked about things like position, velocity, and acceleration. So in the past, we introduced the idea of position. In order to specify a position where an object is located, you actually needed three pieces of information. You needed to know an origin or reference point, a distance from that reference point, but also a direction. Well, similarly, when we discuss rotational motion, if you want to specify an angular position, you need to know both the radius r and the angle theta that we call the angular position. That is the angle through which the particle moves. So angular position is measured uh, counterclockwise uh, from the zero degree mark or the x axis. So when we look at this as a picture, we see something like the following. Now, the reason we, we say that we measure it counterclockwise from the x-axis is basically from our standard definition of like a unit circle. So if you have your four axes, we typically say zero degrees is off on the uh, right. We say 90 degrees is up top, 180 on the left, and 270 down below. So this is kind of hinting at the direction we follow. We go from zero up to 90 degrees, then over to 180, down to 270, and back around to 360. So that's why we say that this is measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis from over here on the right-hand side. So to complete this kind of introduction, we have this concept now of angular position known. It's the angle through which your object moves. Well, as it does that, as it moves along that path, it sweeps out what we call an arc length. So you can see here that as the particle moves from zero degrees at the x-axis, it sweeps out this length of an arc. We give that the symbol s for arc length. Those two quantities, along with radius, are related by the equation theta, or angular position, is your arc length divided by the radius. Now, we don't really use that equation much with our work in this class, but we are going to use it here just to define a new unit. Typically, up until this point, we've been using degrees as our unit for angles. However, when we talk about rotational motion, we have to use radians instead of degrees. Both of them measure angles, just like, for example, meters and feet measure a distance. Here we're talking about radians or degrees measuring an angle. So think about what happens if you travel all the way around a circle. In other words, as we know, 360 degrees. Well, when you travel all the way around a circle, you are completing a revolution. You revolve around the center once. So that arc length in our equation, uh, the equation angular position is s over r, the arc length, the distance you travel around, is the circumference of a circle. So that is our 2 pi r in this equation. And notice what happens. The circumference, 2 pi r, allows us to see that an r cancels out. So if we go all the way around a circle, that is the same as 2 pi radians. So a full circle is either 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. Knowing this allows us to make a new unit conversion, a way to convert between radians and degrees. So you can see that here on the bottom. One radian can be converted to degrees by simply taking the ratio of 360 degrees to two pi radians. When you do this, your radian units cancel out. So you take one times 360 divided by two pi, and you end up with 57.3 degrees. In other words, by definition, a radian is 57.3 degrees. So 
uh, for my own students, you don't ever have to actually work through this and figure out this conversion yourself. I provide this unit uh, conversion factor in my formula sheet that I give, but I thought it was just fascinating to see where it comes from, because if I just told you one radian is 57.3 degrees, that might raise some questions as to how the heck we got there. So, we have now defined angular position, right? Just to step back, angular position is the angle that a particle sweeps out as it moves around in this rotational motion. Well, as it moves around, we can also define a new quantity, angular velocity. So we just talked about angular position and how that can relate to regular position. Well, now we have angular velocity, which directly relates back to the old material when we talked about regular linear velocity, delta x over delta t. Now we're talking about angular velocity. So rather than v for velocity, we have omega. This is the Greek lowercase letter omega, which is kind of a curly w. Omega, the angular velocity, instead of delta x over delta t, is now angular position over time, so delta theta over delta t. So notice the parallel. Instead of v equals delta x over delta t, we have omega is delta theta over delta t. Now looking at this, we could pretty quickly figure out the units. We know that we measure our angle in rotational motion in radians, and we measure time in the base unit of seconds. So the units of angular velocity are radians per second. Much like the units of regular velocity were meters per second. And again, I emphasize the importance of knowing your directions. We just talked about the fact that you start at zero degrees and go counterclockwise. So anything that is considered to be rotating counterclockwise is rotating in a positive direction. In other words, the angular velocity is positive for objects that rotate counterclockwise. Angular velocity, however, is negative for objects that rotate clockwise. This is analogous to when we talked about linear motion, we said anything moving to the right is positive, anything moving to the left is negative, or anything moving up is positive and down is negative. So here, counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. Well, this is just one way to define angular velocity. We do have another way to define it, and that is in relation to period and frequency. Our angular velocity can be given by the full two pi uh, of a circular path. So if you go all the way around a circle once, you sweep out two pi radians. And the time it takes to do that, your delta t, is the period. By definition, if you recall from past lectures, period is the time to complete one revolution. In other words, the time to sweep out two pi radians. So our equation is distance over time. So it's the circumference, two pi radians, over the time, the period which is the same as saying two pi times f, the frequency. Now, one thing to note, this might be a little weird, but I included radians in the equation. So I actually wrote rad into the equation. Really important thing to note here is that that isn't a number, it's not a variable, it's not something you look for or plug in. I'm inserting the unit into the equation just so you remember it's there because it's very easy to kind of forget that radians are here in the equation, because if you just wrote this as two pi over the time, that just looks like, if you were to look at the units, a number something over a time measured in seconds. So it looks like it's units of just one over seconds, but it's not. So be very careful um, to understand that the RAD there stands for radians. That is just me including the unit in the equation so we don't forget about it. Uh, so really the equation is two pi over t or two pi f. Okay, so this is the angular velocity. So how quickly an object is rotating around. This is different than regular velocity though. So let's come up with a way to relate the two. Regular velocity, how fast an object is moving linearly, compared to angular velocity omega, how quickly something is basically rotating around. It's actually quite straightforward with the equations that we have now. Speed and angular speed are directly related. If you take the circular motion equation v equals two pi rf, 
and combine it with the fact that omega, angular velocity, is 2 pi f, well, that old equation we had, you can see we have 2 pi times f here. Well, 2 pi f is omega. So this term is omega. So v is equal to omega times r. In other words, speed is equal to angular speed times the distance r. So you might be wondering what this really means, right? So what does this actually imply? The picture on the right actually shows us this relationship in a really great way. So consider this wind turbine. All parts of it are rotating at the same rate. It's a solid, sturdy object. So every single part of each of those fan blades has to be rotating around with the same angular velocity omega. If it wasn't the case, then the object or the blades would be warping and bending and they would break because it'd be having different parts moving at different angular speeds. That's not possible, unless, of course, it did warp and break apart. So every single point along those fan blades has to be rotating with the same value of omega, the same rotational uh, speed. So what's unique about that, though, is the actual speed, v, depends on the distance r as well, how far away you are from the central axis. So look at what is happening in this picture. This is kind of a very brief time-lapse picture. Um, so notice, a, a particle very close to the center has to only travel a very short distance. But a particle that is at the tip of the fan blade, in the same amount of time, has to sweep out a much greater distance. Right? Notice how much longer that yellow line is up at the top. So even though they're rotating around with the same angular speed, the, uh, the particle at the top of the blade has to move a greater distance, which means it must be moving faster for it to stay caught up. Because notice, they are in line with each other at all times. So that particle has to sweep out a bigger path, so it must be moving faster. In other words, with a greater velocity v, because it is a further distance r away from the center. So this is a very important equation for that conceptual discussion. Now, to essentially prove this, let us work on an example. This will be our first example of rotational motion. So we're actually going to take a wind turbine blade and figure out the speed at two different points along the blade. So, in this example, there's a picture included just for emphasis, but it says a turbine blade is rotating at 25 revolutions per minute. How fast is a point on the blade moving that is A, half a meter from the axis, and b, one meter from the axis. Well, to begin this problem, the very first thing we need to do is understand what's actually given to us. We are given 25 RPMs, in other words, revolutions per minute. So really the first thing you need to do, this is kind of just a mental check, is understand what that actually is. What is a revolution per minute? What variable is that? Well, it's revolutions, something that's happening, per minute. In other words, it's how often something is happening, meaning that is a frequency. 25 revolutions per minute is a frequency. The problem here, however, is the fact that it's in minutes per minute. We use a standard base unit of seconds for time, which means we're going to need to convert that quantity. So the very first mathematical step here is to take our frequency, which is the 25 revolutions, I'm just going to write it out in full, revolutions per minute, that's RPM, and we need to convert this to base units of seconds. So this is just a standard unit conversion. We need to convert minutes to seconds. Minutes are currently in the denominator underneath the fraction here, so we need to put minutes up top so that unit cancels out. And we know that in every one minute, there are 60 seconds. Well, I wrote it like this because the minutes up top cancel out the minutes down below, getting rid of our minute units, and that leaves behind revolutions per second. So we take 25 revolutions divided by 60 seconds to give us 0 0.417 revolutions per second. Now, 
Revolutions is not technically a unit. It's a, th it's a thing that is happening. So it's not really a unit. We're saying it's a thing that's happening per second. So technically, the real unit here, the unit of frequency, as we talked about in the past, is inverse seconds, one over seconds. That is the standard unit. So we have 0.417 inverse seconds. Well, we now have a frequency known. So with this, we are able to determine the angular velocity or speed. Remember, the difference between speed and velocity is just velocity has a direction. You will often hear me swap out the word speed with velocity. There's no fundamental difference when we're just calculating the number. So we can now solve for the angular speed omega. On the previous slide, we saw that omega, angular speed, is equal to 2 pi radians times a frequency f. Well, 2 pi is just 2 pi, we know what that is, and we now understand that the frequency f is 0.417. So we just plug this in. We have 2 pi radians times the quantity 0 0.417 inverse seconds. So again, remember radians is included in the equation just for clarity, so it's 2 pi times 0 0.417 and this gives you roughly 2.62 radians per second. So we now know how quickly this blade is rotating. It is rotating around with an angular speed of 2.62 radians per second. Okay, so we are now finally ready to solve this problem. We're looking for the speed, how fast. In other words, we're looking for V. So really what this is asking for is V equals what? So we have an equation that we just came up with. We said that speed V is directly related to angular speed by the equation V equals omega times R. So I'll label it with a subscript one because we had to do this twice. The angular speed is 2.62 as we just calculated, radians per second. And for part one, or the first part, the uh, distance is half a meter, so 0.5 meters. This gives you our first answer. Half of 2.62 is 1.31, Rad uh, not radians, uh, meters per second. So there is part A's answer. And for this particular problem, part B is identical in terms of what we do. We're solving for the same kind of a thing, so now we're looking for V2, which is omega times R2. Omega is still the same. Every point is rotating at the same rate, 2.62 radians per second times the quantity of one meter. And that's just one times 2.62, so our answer is 2.62 meters per second. And there you have it. So this is a great example because it allows us to see three very important things. First of all, the understanding that frequency is revolutions per minute or revolutions per second. But further, it allows us to calculate both an angular speed and a regular speed to kind of see how the two relate to one another. So be careful. Uh, you know, it, it's, it can be challenging when you have this many Greek symbols. You know, we've got a pi, we've got Omega, we're about to introduce even more. Uh, the units are a little weird. We have revolutions, which is a, you know, a thing. Then we have radians, which is how much of an angle you sweep out. Those two sound similar. So honestly, this, you know, just becoming familiar with this is so important so that you don't get mixed up, uh, you know, perhaps when you're working on homework or a test or something like that. Well, we still have a lot to learn. So let's continue this discussion and practice more. We've now defined angular position and angular speed. Just like in the beginning of our course, we defined position and regular speed. Well, after regular speed in the, back in the day, we then introduced acceleration. So we now introduce angular acceleration. In the past, regular acceleration was defined as a change in velocity over a change in time. Well, very similarly, 
An angular acceleration, given by the Greek letter alpha, is a change in angular velocity over a change in time. So instead of a equals delta v over delta t, we have alpha equals delta omega over delta t. Again, it's completely analogous to that old material. It's the same fundamental equation. It's the rate of change of something. But this time we're just talking angularly. Well, we measure angular speed omega in radians per second and time in seconds. So that leaves behind units of radians per second squared. Just like regular acceleration was meters per second squared. Now, our directions are a little more complex when we talk acceleration. And this was true back in the old material as well. A velocity is positive if it's to the right, negative if it's to the left. But regular acceleration was not necessarily as easy. You could be moving to the right and picking up speed, in which case your acceleration is also to the right and it's positive. But you could also still be moving to the right with a positive velocity, but be slowing down which means your acceleration pointed in the opposite direction, which means it would be negative. That same kind of play here with positives and negatives is attributed to angular acceleration as well. So angular acceleration is positive anytime we have a counterclockwise acceleration. So that can happen in one of two different ways. You could be rotating in the positive counterclockwise direction and speeding up. So you're moving in the positive counterclockwise direction and picking up speed. So just like in the past, we said if you're picking up speed, acceleration points in the same direction as your motion, which is also in the positive direction. Or you could also be moving in the negative or clockwise direction, but be slowing down. Anytime you are slowing down, acceleration points in the opposite direction of your motion. So in that case, we're moving in the clockwise negative direction, but slowing down. So acceleration points in the opposite direction, the positive direction. So that is the two ways acceleration can be positive, or excuse me, angular acceleration could be positive. And then the opposite is true for negative. Angular acceleration would be negative anytime you're rotating in the negative direction and speeding up, or rotating in the positive direction and slowing down. So again, it is, it's, it's a little tricky, again, because we're talking rotation, but it's the exact same discussion we had with regular acceleration. So again, practice makes perfect. So review these things, practice them. Um, we'll even do a question or two related to this at the end of this lecture to kind of reinforce these ideas together. Okay, well, we related speed v to angular speed omega Let's do the same with acceleration. Let's relate regular acceleration A to angular acceleration alpha. This one can be a little bit more tricky conceptually, so let's jump into this. What we're gonna be looking at is a tangential acceleration, A subscript T. This is not to be confused with centripetal acceleration that we talked about in previous lectures when discussing circular motion. I know this is confusing, but Centripetal acceleration, the one we talked about in the past, that was due to a change in the particle's velocity um, because of its change in direction, right? So anytime you're moving around in a circular path, you are always changing your direction. So you are always changing your velocity because it's a vector and thus you're always accelerating. And that's acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. What we're talking about now is different we aren't talking about that centripetal acceleration due to a change in direction. This time we're actually talking about a, a pickup of speed in that circular path, so a delta omega. Well, when you're picking up speed, we then have an acceleration because that is, I mean, quite literally the definition of acceleration, a change in the speed over a change in the time. So let's take that regular definition of acceleration, A equals delta V over delta T. Well, just moments ago, we said that regular speed v is equal to omega times r. So we're swapping out v for omega r in this equation. But we can kind of do a little math trick here. 
r, the radius of the circular path, should not be changing. So right now it is inside of this delta term, but why not take it and pull it out? Because that isn't going to be changing. It doesn't need to be attached to the delta. So by doing that, it makes what we're showing here a bit more clear because that leaves behind delta omega over delta t times the quantity r. Well, by definition, delta omega over delta t is alpha. So this term here is, by definition, alpha. So we end up with regular acceleration a is alpha times r. Just like we had in the past, v equals omega r. Very similar equations. So speed is angular speed times r, and acceleration is angular acceleration times r. So just make sure to not confuse this conceptually with centripetal acceleration, and you'll be fine. Um, we very rarely use these equations anyways. It's just important to see them conceptually. Okay. Well, everything we've been saying is analogous to our old material. Just like we had speed, or excuse me, just like we had position x, speed v, and acceleration a, we now have angular position theta, angular speed omega, and angular acceleration alpha. Everything's analogous. All the equations have looked the same, which means even our big three equations for motion will be the same as well. So we had our big three equations, the velocity equation, the position equation, and then the last one was the time independent equation. Well, swap out your v's for omegas, swap out your a's for alphas, and swap out your um, x's for theta. The equations are exactly the same. So these are our three equations of motion for angular or rotational motion. The good news, perhaps, is that I will not require the use of these three equations very commonly. Uh, they will be used, but not, not very much. It'll be fairly infrequent. Um, namely because it's more related to older material and we're trying to move on with our new unit in the class. Uh, we will do an example here that does apply one of these equations just so you can see how it's used. But beyond that, we don't use it too much, uh, both for the sake of simplicity and the fact that we are moving on from the older material. So, that said, let's work on one more example for this lecture, and this is a complex one. It's actually a fairly challenging problem, all things considered, because it basically takes in everything we've learned so far about rotational motion. So, this problem says that a drill is rotating counterclockwise, starting from rest, and moving up to 40 revolutions per second in just two and a half seconds. It first asks for the drill's angular acceleration, alpha. Okay. Well, to begin, very similarly to the last problem, we have to understand what we're given. We're given 40 revolutions per second. That is a frequency. Again, it's how often something is happening. So let's take that frequency and use it to calculate the angular velocity of the drill, just like we have before. So let's start again with frequency. We're given our frequency, which is the 40 revolutions per second or 40 inverse seconds. Remember, revolutions isn't really a unit. So we can use that to figure out omega. By definition, omega, the angular speed, is 2 pi radians times the frequency. In other words, 2 pi radians times our 40 inverse seconds. So let's see, that's 2 times 40, so 80, 80 times pi. Uh, I, I believe with a little bit of rounding, we will see 250 radians per second. So this drill is rotating around with an angular speed of 250 radians every single second. We're now able to solve for angular acceleration. We have a definition for it, angular acceleration alpha is equal to your change in omega over your change in time. Well, we are going from rest to 250 radians per second. So remember, delta is final minus initial. So that would be 250 radians per second 
minus the initial, which is just zero because it started at rest. That says radians. You probably can't see it, but zero radians per second. Well, all of this gets divided by the time it takes, which is told to be 2.5 seconds. So we have 250 divided by 2.5. That's one you can probably do in your head. That's just 100. 100 radians per second squared. That's part A, right? Part A asked us to solve for that angular acceleration. So we just found our angular speed and then used that to calculate angular acceleration using delta omega over delta t, your change in angular velocity over your change in time. Okay, that part I think is at least somewhat straightforward. Again, it's still weird using all these Greek symbols and talking about rotation, but it's a pretty direct calculation. Part B can at least be a little bit more tricky. Um, it says, how many revolutions does it make in this time? So again, this is one of those points where you have to really ask yourself, what is it looking for? Well, how many revolutions means how many times does it go around a circle, right? A revolution is going around a circle once. So it's asking, how many times do we go around a circle? Well, to figure that out, we would want to calculate the angular displacement. In other words, what angle do we sweep out as we're moving around in this two and a half seconds? So that's our first goal. And then once we have that, we want to convert those radians to revolutions. But we'll get to that. So we're looking for delta theta. How big of an angle do we sweep out? And that, you know, we could be going around numerous times, so it can be more than two pi radians. So we have the equation from the previous slide. Let me just jump back to it for a second. Delta theta, if you look at the a middle equation, would equal omega i times delta t plus one half alpha delta t squared. So we have delta theta is omega initial times delta t plus one half alpha times delta t squared. Now, the good news here is that our initial angular velocity is zero. That whole term goes to zero because we're initially at rest. The drill isn't rotating initially. So really all we have is one half the angular acceleration, which is 100 radians per second squared, uh, times the time squared, which is 2.5 seconds quantity squared. This gives us a total number of radians uh, or an angular position of 312 so, in this two and a half seconds, the drill sweeps out 312.5 radians. But we are asked how many revolutions it makes. How many times do we go around a circle? Well, remember, one full circle is two pi radians. So, what we have to do is take that and just convert. We have 312.5 radians. And we know that in every one revolution, in other words, one time around a circle, there are two pi radians. So that allows our unit to cancel out. We have radians over radians. So we essentially are just taking 312 and a half divided by two pi. This will give you approximately 50 revolutions. And there you have it. So certainly a more complex example. Um, it involves multiple steps, but um, you know, hopefully this process and laying out in words what I'm doing throughout the process helps make a little bit more sense of what is occurring. So again, just I think the hardest part, just from my own experience at least, is just making sure you don't get confused with revolutions and radians or angular speed and angular velocity. The terms sound similar. So it can be uh, added confusion on top of the fact that we're using Greek symbols now to represent things, which can be even trickier. So again, just be careful. So to close out this lecture, let us do a few end of lecture questions. This first one will require uh, a small amount of calculation. So it says a ball rolls around a circular track with an angular velocity of four pi radians per second. 
what would the period capital T be? So I'll write that capital T. Okay. Well, if we want to solve this, we need to find a relationship between angular velocity and period. That relationship exists because we have angular velocity omega equal to two pi over the period t. So if we're trying to solve for the period t, that would be two pi over omega. In this case, that's two pi divided by whatever omega was given as, which is four pi. So two pi divided by four pi is one half. So the answer for this problem is one half, half a second. A is your answer. Now remember, if I didn't give you enough time to think about your answer before I started talking about it, you can pause the video. So uh, I always encourage that. Pause the video once I read the question, give yourself time to actually think about it, and then continue the video to see if you were correct. I really encourage that, right? I say it all the time, but the best way to learn physics is to do physics. So you should really attempt these on your own. Okay, so here, question two. Rashid and Sophia are riding on a merry ground that is spinning steadily. Sophia, S, is twice as far from the axis as Rashid, R. How, do, how does Sophia's angular velocity compare to Rashid's? Okay, well, we're talking about angular velocity omega. This is a rigid object. They are along a solid surface. This solid surface is going to be rotating around at a constant rate. I can't show that. I wish I could animate this red line, but just imagine this red line spinning around. It, the, the object is rotating at a constant rate. So everything, no matter where you are, S or R, you're gonna have the same value of omega. You're rotating around with the same angular velocity. Here's the next question though. It looks very similar. Here, it's the same setup, but it asks how does Sophia's regular speed, in other words, V, compare to that of Rashid's? So take a minute to think about that one. Okay, so in this case, um, we know that the equation is V equals omega times r. So if that's the case, we now understand that uh, Sophia in this case, if you look at the picture, is twice as far away as Rashid. So she has double the radius r in this case. So if you double r in this equation, you're also going to be doubling the speed v. So Sophia has twice the speed as Rashid. And again, this is just like that fan blade example. I'm gonna go way back for a second. Just like that fan blade example, a point near the front of, or near the center of the blade only sweeps out a small distance, but a point further away has to sweep out a greater distance. It is moving faster. So that's exactly what we saw here with Rashid and Sophia. Sophia being further away from the center has to be traveling at a greater speed. Okay, this brings us to our final question of this lecture on rotational motion. It says that the fan blade is slowing down and the picture shows you which way it's rotating. So what are the signs, positive or negative, of angular speed omega and angular acceleration alpha? Okay, well, in this case, notice the arrows. The arrows in this diagram show that the object is rotating in a clockwise direction. It's rotating around in a clockwise direction, which means omega is negative. This rules out options A and options B because omega has to be negative. It's the counter, or excuse me, it's the clockwise direction. So now we just have to figure out, is the acceleration positive or negative? Remember our rule. We're slowing down in this example. Anytime you are slowing down, acceleration points in the opposite direction of your motion, meaning it is positive. The answer is C. Okay, well, that's it for the first part of this lecture. We still have a few more lectures in, that deal with rotational motion. 
Uh, moving forward, our next lecture will talk about torque. And then when we talk about torque, we'll shift gears to rotational dynamics. So uh, get into some really interesting things like center of gravity, moment of inertia, all that kind of good stuff. So that's coming up next. As always, thank you for watching and have a great day.